Tervetuloa dosenttiin. Meillä on täällä vieraana Helsingin yliopistosta Fulbright by Centennial professori Scott Buchanan. Uh, welcome to Docenti, Scott. Thank you for having me. Uh, from the beginning we start with a very straightforward question. What kind of a good force brings a distinguished professor of political science from very uh, sunny southern Carolina to cold and remote Finland? Well, thank you for having me. The University of Helsinki has a wonderful program in the Department of Cultures in which there is a focus on North American studies. And my particular focus is American politics. And the University and Fulbright Finland were good enough to invite me over to Finland for this uh, academic year to teach courses on American politics to also include the American presidency, southern politics, and uh, U.S. elections. Uh, it is customary here that we will give the person under interview a, a possibility to explain his or her history. What is, sir, what is your history? Uh, what is your way to, to, I mean, what kind of America you spent your childhood and youth? I am a native Georgian, state of Georgia, And I grew up in rural Georgia, uh, about 80 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so the United States that I grew up in 30 plus years ago when I was in my teenage years was a nation that was transforming and in transition. But I grew up in a rural America, whereas the United States over the last two, three decades has become mm. increasingly urbanized. Mm. But my background is, is in a rural, rural Georgia, rural America. Uh, you have graduated from first from University of Georgia. Did you already know that your future path would lead to ac academic trail? Not at all. I, when I entered the University of Georgia, uh, my goal was to become an attorney and I started off and for the first three years of my undergraduate career, I thought that I would go to law school and become an attorney uh, in the United States. However, uh, in my senior year of, co of uh, college, a uh, political science professor at the University of Georgia took great interest in uh, my uh, studies And it was largely due to his influence mm. that I decided to ultimately go into academia. And uh, it allowed me to pursue my interest in understanding politics and understanding the forces that, uh, that shape and mold politics. So, uh, and in fact, that professor is still teaching <laughs> even now. So he's still around. Uh Now, now, Scott, have you ever been contemplated the possibility that if you would have been a lawyer, what kind of life you have had? I mean, have you ever had regrets or? No, no real regrets. I, uh, I have friends who are attorneys. They are not always the happiest people mm. with their career choices. And uh, having talked to them and heard their daily uh, travails and woes, I'm very, very happy that I went into academia. Now, Then question why the political history? You've been writing uh, about Southern politics and in oral histories of Georgia political figures in 1950s and 60s. What raised your interest to these political figures? Well, in part, my interest came from growing up and hearing older relatives talk and discuss the politics of the you know, not only the 1950s and 60s, but up to current day uh, for that period of time. Um, so part of it was just being aware of politics mm -hmm. from hearing older relatives discuss it. But as I became more interested in it as a scholar, it has to do largely with the uh, 1950s, 60s were a huge, huge period of mm -hmm. transformation in American politics post-World War II, mm. uh, industrial changes that were coming to the United States. And so I became interested to understand how the political figures mm. of that day were navigating those turbulent waters. Mm. Uh, some wanted to hold on to the past at all cost. 
others were willing to embrace the future. And so it was, uh, but what interested me was where these uh, particular political actors were mm -hmm. coming from, their bases of support, mm -hmm. and uh, what ultimately led to uh, you know, substantial change uh, in the American South and more broadly speaking, the entire country. So it was the uh, poli uh, dilemma of political change yes. to bring you to these exactly. questions. Now, um, your latest book, The Future Ain't What We Used to Be, examines the uh, 2016 presidential elections. Uh, the question is, is there a kind of a common pattern how these southern states vote and, and act? Broadly speaking, over the last 50 years, Southern states in the American South have tended to vote Republican mm. uh, for president, for Republican nominees. Uh, and that was the projection even 10 years ago that that is a trend that would just continue without end. However, and part of the reason that book is titled what mm. it is, is that there is change going on in the American South. And most notably, you can see this in the state of Virginia, mm -hmm. that once was solidly Republican, reliably Republican, since 2008 has become reliably Democratic. And part of the reason for that is migration into Virginia from people not only from within the United States, but even around the world for that mm -hmm. matter. But from within the United States, much of that migration is coming from other sections of the country and has transformed the state of Virginia. And that same force is at work in Florida mm. to a lesser degree as in play in, a, in the state of Georgia, my home state. Mm. It's also in play in Texas. And in the next decade, you could see that playing out in both North and South Carolina. So uh, what you're seeing is this migration is transforming some states, whereas some other states mm. in the South are becoming even more Republican mm. because the, trans the, the migration is not occurring in some states like, say, Alabama or Bill Clinton's home mm. state of Arkansas, and they're becoming, in fact, more Republican. And so it's become a much more dynamic situation, whereas... Historically, you could just say, okay, the South all voted, all Southern states voted the same way. Mm. Now it's becoming more nuanced. So what is your learned uh, opinion then about the outcome of this change? How the South will change I think in what political you're, sense? I think what you will see is you will see some states, some of the ones I just mentioned, you will see a state like Florida, the Carolinas, uh, Georgia, Texas, uh, you will see them looking a bit more like, mm. politically speaking, like Virginia. I don't know that it, that's going to happen mm. this decade, but by the next decade, you could really begin to see some profound political changes because all of those states are increasing in population. Now, the question, of course, comes very naturally. Why 2016 the South uh, voted for Trump? I think you could say, broadly speaking, why did a lot of states vote <laughs> for Donald Trump? I think if you look at the election in 2016, Donald Trump touched upon concerns that many voters, especially in rural America, had. That there was a concern about globalism, there was a concern about where jobs were going, mm -hmm. It's a concern about the United States' place in the world. Also a concern about illegal immigration mm -hmm. into the United States. And Trump was able to play, touch upon those concerns mm -hmm. in a very, very effective way. And he certainly did win every southern state with the exception, again, of Virginia. Mm -hmm. But he also won some very unlikely states that delivered him the presidency, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, those states, much of the same pattern of rural voters mm -hmm. voting for Donald Trump that you saw in the South was going on around the country. 
And a large part of that is, is our economic concerns of you know, bringing industry back to the mm. United States, preserving jobs. Mm. So it, in, for many voters, it was an economic uh, vote and consideration. So it's the economy that decides. Yes. As is usually the case in American <laughs> politics. Yes. I mean, the, the presidents are blamed for bad economies and mm. they are given the credit for good economies mm. even though they may not deserve that blame or credit. Precisely. Now, uh, we go back to your academic career. As we know, in, in the United States, it's a little bit different. You have to find your tenure, your your uh, permanent position. And what was your way? You You came from Auburn, You had your MA there, and then you made your uh, PhD at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. That is, was it difficult? That is correct. Um, as far as the degrees go, the PhD was very difficult. <laughs> uh, masters less so, but the mm. PhD was, was difficult. But what has happened in the United States over the last two decades is that the number of tenure-track positions, in other words, mm. positions where tenure is an option, have become a little less numerous, mm. fewer and fewer. And so I felt very fortunate that I was able to land a tenure track position immediately out of graduate school. Uh, Congratulations. For my PhD. Yeah. And was able to work my way up through the tenure process and also uh, the ranks up to full professor. So my uh, ac academia has been good to me. Uh, now, The question goes, goes, of course, automatically. Have you been able to settle here into Finland? I mean, have there been some problems or so other things, you know? I mean, have you been easily I, I would say settling here? I would say overall very easily. We have uh, felt like my family and I have, have assimilated quite easily into Finland. Uh, we find your country to be quite delightful. And uh, we uh, we enjoy the quietness of, of Finland and the, the civility and discourse uh, that we've, we've found in, in Finland. So um, we felt like, you know, we, we, we've blended in quite well and the Finns may not think so, but you know, <laughs> we felt like we have blended in well and have found your country to be very welcoming. Now, I've been told that every Fulbright professor here who's visiting has created his own special school or had, has made his own imprint or own label to American studies at the University of Helsinki. What kind of legacy or what kind of uh, important uh, matter you would uh, like to leave here? I think if, it, if I had to boil it down to one single thing, I, I would want to get across to the students and to anyone else for that matter, that There, how much diversity there is in the United States in terms of the, the larger cities of the United States, say New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, versus the rest of the country. Uh, and I have found that with my students at the university, when I ask them, have you been to the United States? Yes. Where have you been? New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, maybe Las Vegas. And they find it hard to understand the po politics of the United States because mm. they've only seen the largest cities of the United mm. States. And so if, if I can uh, leave here in a few more months, if I can leave with the students understanding a bit more about middle America, I will, I will consider that a job well done. Very good. Now, uh, let's go to the then the... Uh, heated political question. Of course, the U.S. presidential elections are very important. Now, how would you characterize the political situation now in the United States? Unfortunately, it's a very uh, divisive time in the United States um, in which you have um, a sizable number of Americans who uh, dislike, mm -hmm. rather intensely dislike mm -hmm. President Trump. Then you have a sizable number of Americans who very much like President mm. Trump. And there's not a great deal of anyone in the middle any longer. You either like Trump or you hate Trump is, is what, mo what has happened over the last four years especially. 
And so it does create some concerns because if you look at political discourse in the United States, that historically citizens were willing to think the best of one another, mm -hmm. and even if they politically disagreed, shrug their shoulders and say, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's becoming more commonplace for citizens to be shouting at one mm -hmm. another and trying to outshout one another and, and not a great deal of understanding of another person's perspective. That's been going on really for the last decade, but it, it's picked up some speed in the last four years. So is there any possibility for political reconciliation or, or kind of a uh, detente between these two parties? Uh, the, well, the possibility always exists. I don't see it in 2020. When mm -hmm. I look at the uh, presidential candidates on the Democratic side or um, for President Trump, I don't see the, that centrist candidate Mm. who can, you know, bring together all sides. So I don't know that that's going to happen over the next four years. Um, I think we're looking at this point in time, what does it look like in 2024 mm. when Americans are voting again? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, what is your bet then? To whom you will you will bet your money? I mean, who shall be the next president of the United States? Um, <laughs> wow. Well, I don't bet on elections, uh, but that being said, if the election were held today, I think Donald Trump mm. is reelected. But it's not, the election's not today. We still have uh, another seven months before mm. the election. Anything can and probably will happen along the way to November. But looking at the current political landscape, uh, I think it will be largely dependent upon who the Democrats nominate will dictate President Trump's chances. I think you always, the smart money is always on the incumbent president mm. to get reelected. In fact, if you look since the uh, Second World War, only two incumbent presidents have been denied mm. reelection. Uh, so the smart money is on President Trump to be reelected. But how close is the election? That's going to depend upon mm. who the Democrats nominate. Mm. Now, uh, anyone who will be elected, of course, has a huge duties. And, uh, and one of those duties would be that he would play a kind of role of Abraham Lincoln that would heal the, the wounds of this national struggle. What would you think is there a possibility for this kind of a political change? Um, looking at President Trump in a potential second term, I don't, you know, it would, it would be a tough job, but mm. here's one of the things that presidents in their second terms often will do. They will begin to look more and more at their legacy mm. and will look more and more, how is history going to judge mm. my presidency? And so in many cases, presidents in their second term of office will try to be the, uh, the one who is uh, bringing reconciliation to the country. So I, I suspect you may, if President Trump is granted a second term, I suspect you will see him attempting to do that. However, that being said, <laughs> with social media, with the 24-7 news cycle in the United States, it's a tougher task mm. than it was for and Abraham Lincoln, obviously, but even you know more recent presidents, it, it's a more difficult task in mm. 2020 than it was in, say, 1984. W would you think that uh, President Trump would reduce his tweeting or? I don't think so. I, I think what you see is what you get with Donald Trump. Uh, okay. he, he uses Twitter and social media as his media outlet to get mm -hmm. his message out. I, I don't envision that he's going to change that at this point. Okay. Now, uh, let's go then to the relations between two great nations, United States and Finland. Uh, as you know, the relations between these uh, countries are excellent. There are no real disputes, not even border disputes. The actual disagreements between these two powers are disappointingly non-existent. Now, um, how would you 
characterize the, these these relations? I think you, I think you've just done a wonderful <laughs> job. I mean, friendly, mm -hmm. friendly, yeah. uh, solid relationship. Uh, the United States has certainly uh, valued Finland and its uh, special position in the world, shall we say, uh, and so especially during the Cold mm -hmm. War. Uh, the uh, United States uh, considered Finland to be, you know, one of our staunchest allies. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm not, a, I, th I think what, how you have described it, warm and friendly, I think is an accurate description for for. Finnish American relations or American Finnish relations, if you prefer. Uh, the question, of course, is that does that stereotype still go on? I mean, when the Finland paid its loan to America as the only nation, do the Americans have the warm heart towards Finland? I believe, yeah, I believe so. I mean, as as far as the repayment of the loan, I'm not sure that the average American. Uh, is terribly aware of that because for most Americans, they just expect that if you loan money out, it's, it may not come back, it may not get mm -hmm. repaid. And so, uh, but as far as the, you know, the relationship, I, for those Americans who are familiar with, with mm -hmm. Finland, uh, I, th I believe they're warm feelings uh, for Finland. I've never heard any crosswords yeah. uh, or negative uh, statements about Finland. Is there something we should, you know, do better or, you know, to develop or make up some new ideas concerning, you know, relations? You know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think if, if uh, you look at that, the current relationship, I think it's a good one. Um, I can't really offer any suggestions in that regard. I, th I think it's, it's a good relationship and I can't really think of any suggestions that I would make. Now, uh, someone has said that uh, Finland is the most Americanized countries in the world, that the Finland would suit wonderfully as a, a 53rd or was it a state of the United States? What do you think that they would be a kind of a uh, submerged to the Union? I, oh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I like your country quite well as it is. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I, uh, there, there are some countries around the world who would not, you know, would not take kindly to being referred to as the 51st state. But, um, you know, I, I, I quite like your country just the way it is. I'll, I'll, how about that? You're very diplomatic. Now, uh, are there some things we in Finland should learn from the United States? You know, one of the things that I have noticed and, and part of being a Fulbright scholar is learning not only about your host nation, but also learning a bit about your own nation. Um, I think if you look, and one of the observations I've detected is that uh, Americans are very, have a healthy skepticism mm -hmm. about almost everything, and including government. And one of the things I've noticed with my students at the university is that they tend to be uh, very trusting of government. Oh yeah. <laughs> Being, okay, this has been told to us, this is the case. Mm. And uh, for most Americans, that's not the case. Mm. They hear something coming from the government and is immediately, I'm not so sure that I agree with that. Yeah. And so maybe a, maybe a little skepticism, but <laughs> at the same time, skepticism can be taken too far. Yeah. And I think you can see that in the United States right now, that if you take the skepticism too far, mm. it can lead to the civil discourse that we see, that we, that we have now. Now, Professor Buchanan, uh, then the last question actually is that, uh, how do you see the global role of the United States in the nowadays world? I mean, United States is definitely the biggest player in, in, the, in the playground, the biggest, biggest of there. So, does it still have the, the role of the whistleblower there? I think, I think at a basic level, yes, the, the U.S.'s role is, is the same. Now, what happens from president to president, administration to administration, there's a bit different focus, but it's still the, 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 the United States' role that has been there really since the end of World War II. I don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. Um, 
I think I think the United States will continue to remain involved uh, in the U in the world. I think one of the things that you can see during the Trump administration mm -hmm. so far is a little bit more reluctance, a little more skepticism mm -hmm. about being too involved. But one of the things that President Trump has shown is that when he can discern a clear U.S. interest mm -hmm. in, in intervention in some sh shape, form, or fashion, he mm -hmm. will do that. But okay. short of being able to directly tie that to U.S. interest, he's more likely to remain out so it compared doesn't mean, to other presidents. So it doesn't mean isolation? No. So the no. United States will still play the big role? I, I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. Now, the final, final question. Professor Buchanan, do you have any personal dreams to fulfill here in Finland? Personal dreams? Um, I'm planning to go to Lapland again <laughs> next month, and I'm hoping to see the Northern Lights. So where I come from in the United States, Northern Lights are non-existent. So Northern Lights. Thank you very much for the great interview. Thank you. Toset jatkaa Yhdysvaltaa asioiden tarkastelua ja tuo teille aina hyviä vieraita, jotka keskustelevat myös tulevista vaaleista. Katsohan aina dosetti.